This is Global Health and I'm Gail Fraser and we're going to be talking about preventing communicable disease today and it's an area that I have a particular interest in and I think that uh, I've got an interesting presentation for you. This is Unit 14 and these are not regular house flies. These are tsetse flies. They're very aggressive and it's difficult to keep them away especially from children. We're going to discuss the link between public health and prevention of infectious disease or communicable disease. Examine strategies for disease prevention through vector control. So we're going to be looking at health conditions that are caused by transmission of disease through vectors. So mosquitoes, um, sand flies, tsetse flies. And I'm going to be talking a case study for different parts of Africa, focusing on East Africa, and of course Latin America has a few uh, in vector-borne infectious diseases as well. When we're looking at Africa, the funding is made available for what they are calling neglected tropical diseases. They're diseases that tend to be more rare, so maybe there's only a, a handful of cases, and because there are so few cases and the location of these infections typically is sub-Saharan Africa, there is unfortunately very little investment in research on curative treatments for these health conditions. So these, that's why they're called neglected tropical diseases. When you're looking at the Afro WHO area, so we're looking at sub-Saharan Africa in particular, these are the focus countries. So these are countries that have particularly difficult challenges related to neglected tropical diseases. So we have Sudan, we have Ethiopia, Mali. So they would have a very similar type of drier environment. Whereas when you look at Senegal, or Ghana, Tanzania, and Mozambique, part of the problem is that these are very low resource locations. They are huge levels of poverty in these countries. Sudan, if we want to look at that, is, has high hopes of defeating these neglected tropical diseases. But unfortunately, decades of war, civil strife within, neglect, lack of development has left South Sudan and Sudan itself, as well as Darfur, with nine out of ten identified neglected tropical diseases. So these are things that primary health care people have to be constantly screening for. This little girl is being tested and it looks like they're actually measuring her arm to make sure she's growing well. In Sudan, one in four, one in four, 25 percent of the people in Darfur, which is western Sudan, Sudan and South Sudan are able to access health services. And these are the most basic primary health care services. So that means that 75 percent of the people have no access. And this is really a huge problem in Sudan. About 90 percent of rural women are illiterate. So again, the types of health interventions you might try to use in Colombia wouldn't work in Sudan because the literacy rate is so low leaving this, this South Sudan they're talking about that has the highest rates of maternal and infant mortality, one of the highest in the world. I think Afghanistan is actually the highest, but it's phenomenal. We'll see a video that talks about that in a few minutes. South Sudan has nine out of ten of these neglected tropical diseases as well, but all except Chagas disease. Chagas disease is exclusively in South America, so that's the American trypanosomiasis. So let's talk about guinea worm. It is one of the weirdest uh, infections that I have ever seen. According to the World Health Organization, Sudan is a reservoir for guinea worm disease and is properly called dronunculitis, with only less than a thousand cases worldwide. Few other patients have uh, guinea worm disease are in Ethiopia, Chad, and Niger, at least disease that has been identified. So we're talking about a restricted area of these, as you can see the adult worm that caused a big ulcer on this child's foot, it looks like a child, uh, and the worm, the adult worm is coming out. 
That's how they leave, lay their larvae, eggs and larvae. So we're talking about just restricted areas, Ethiopia, Sudan, Chad, and Niger, or Niger. The World Health Organization defines these neglected tropical diseases, and guinea worm or adrenoculitis is one of them, and it only is found in the very poorest areas. And these areas, stank, stagnant water sources are host to the copiapod, which carry the larvae that, that penetrate the skin, so it's a cycle. So you may tell your kids, hey, we got to filter the water, we need to boil it. But you can see these boys who are out in the desert, whatever they're doing, hunting, or they just drink in the water directly out of uh, a muddy pond. And this is one of the ways that people are, the cycle is continued. They're reinfected through in, ingesting the copiapod. And you can see the, from this picture, this removed uh, guinea worm is really long. And you can see it's coming, it's like a thread-like thing coming out of this person's ulcer on the side of their leg. So this is pretty gross. <laughs> Fascinating though. The cycle of the guinea worm you can see, as I mentioned, we have a, an individual here that is infected with adult guinea worm. She puts her foot in the water and the adult takes advantage and shoots out the larvae. It actually erupts from the, the uh, you can see in this picture where it comes out of the person's foot. The larvae are carried by the copiapod, which then is ingested, and then we start the whole cycle again so that the cycle continues the spread of guinea worm in stagnant water. You can see this is a very long one that's being extracted because one of the biggest problems is not so much the fact that the worm is there. It causes blockage of lymph nodes, just like elephantiasis does, and it causes great allergic reaction. So you see the swelling in this person's ankle on their foot in response to having that foreign body in their system. Neglected tropical diseases. Here's another one. African trypanosomiasis. African sleeping sickness is the common name. And it treatments exist, but they're quite toxic. So again, pharmaceutical companies haven't invested in treatments for these neglected tropical diseases. The disease is always fatal, so it's not just something minor. The African sleeping sickness is a serious health condition and it's transmitted by the tsetse fly. The problem with trying to avoid getting bitten by tsetse, tsetse flies is they're very aggressive. I know that when we go into endemic areas where there are lots of tsetse flies, they tend to be around the herds of animals, so a wildebeest, when you've got uh, different types of herding animals, and so these tsetse flies are attracted to the animals, but as we go into the area, they actually coat our vehicle with some kind of chemical to keep them as a repellent. And then of course we have our DEET head to toe on our clothing, on our skin, to protect us from uh, the bites, but they're very aggressive. They just come in and boom, they hammer you. So you've got to keep protect yourself from getting bitten from the tsetse fly. So let's look at the video that's related to post-conflict Sudan is a researcher who is presenting her uh, project. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by Jennifer Palmer from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who's going to be discussing African sleeping sickness in post-conflict southern Sudan. Jennifer, thank you very much for joining us today. Sure. Now, first of all, Jennifer, you're going to be presenting a poster session at the conference about African sleeping sickness. Tell us a bit about it. Why is it so devastating? Um, well, sleeping sickness um, caused by a parasite called a trypanosome, uh, it's only found in Africa where uh, the vector of the disease, the tsetse fly, lives. Um, and the type of sleeping sickness that I'm studying, Gambiense, uh, is the kind that causes over 95% of infections in Africa. Um, and they, the most endemic countries in the world are also the ones dealing with the post-conflict context. Southern Sudan, where I'm doing the study, is the third most endemic country in Africa. Um, and sleeping sickness within countries is incredibly geographically focal, meaning it's not all over the country. It's only in very small areas where 
the Tsik Tsik Lai can live. Um, so in the, the place where I'm doing the study, in a place called Nimale, uh, it's about 1% prevalence, meaning that 1% um, of people in the population have an infection that will be fatal within three years unless they get access to testing and treatment. So why is it so devastating? What are some of the symptoms? It affects your blood. Um, it looks a lot like other more common diseases, such as malaria or typhoid. Um, it causes fever and aches and pains. But when it goes into your brain, that's when it goes into stage two, and that's when you get to see the very specific symptoms, such as uh, changes in your sleep-wake cycle. So you get people um, sleeping excessively during the daytime and awake at night. You also get behavioral changes and neurological changes. So you get anything from convulsions, paralysis, to hallucinations, um, and general behavior change. So it's, it's quite a dramatic disease, um, and it, it affects but the patient, the family, and, and the community because of how ill a patient gets, but also how they change their behavior. Now, I understand with your PhD, you're looking to develop a new strategy to tackle this disease. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. Well, it actually came out of a more descriptive study that I was doing, um, studying a, a program run by Merlin, which is a, medical, a British medical NGO um, that's running a sleeping sickness control program in southern Sudan. Um, and I was looking at some of the, the barriers that patients face getting access to testing and the, the problems that providers have in, in connecting patients to that test so that they can get treatment for the fatal disease. Um, and one of the problems that we found was that health workers um, from peripheral healthcare facilities, so outside of the hospital where the screening center, the test is offered, um, they were not participating as much as they could in community referral networks most of the work of connecting patients to the test was being done by patients and communities themselves or by staff health workers at the hospital. Um, so we decided to try and target a training intervention to um, improve the knowledge that peripheral health workers have of the signs and symptoms of sleeping sickness so that they can actually refer patients to the hospital to get a test and treatment if they need it. Um, this may seem like quite an obvious thing to do, train health workers to recognize signs of disease. But actually, um, if you read the literature, no one has ever reported doing this. So this is um, some, something, a strategy that we're trying to do, um, and we think that is appropriate to the post-conflict context where health workers have been denied training opportunities for decades, um, and there aren't a lot of resources to be able to do more active screening approaches where you actually send um, teams out into communities. Um, that approach is, is very good for disease control, but it, it costs money, so we're looking at, at other ways to try and accomplish disease control objectives and save lives. Now, you've touched on healthcare workers there a bit. Why are they so key in all of this? Yeah. Uh, well, they can support uh, patients to get to the hospital. Uh, right now, the situation is um, that if patients realize that they are sick, sick enough to treat care, um, and then decide to go to the hospital, then health workers at that point, um, once they're in the hospital, can help point them towards a sleeping sickness test. But if they go to seek treatment from health workers any, any time um, earlier on that treatment-seeking pathway before they get to the hospital, right now what we're seeing is that health workers that they encounter on the way just don't know the signs and symptoms of sleeping sickness. And before we did the intervention, I interviewed health workers and they told me they didn't even know that there was a screening program in the, in the hospital that is in their region. Um, so this seemed like a really important uh, intervention to introduce in this context. And finally, Jennifer, why are conferences like the Canadian Conference on Global Health so important for giving a platform for your work? Well, actually, the sleeping sickness research world is quite small, actually. Sleeping sickness is a neglected disease, uh, meaning it doesn't get a lot of attention from funders and, and media until today. <laughs> um, and so there aren't a lot of people sort of within our circle um, to, for me to really learn from and share the, the news. So I'm hoping that um, a platform like CSIH will allow me to share the research and discuss more with uh, people who really have an interest in this disease. Well, it's a fascinating topic, Jennifer. Best of luck with the conference. Thanks. This is Global Health, and this is Unit 14, Part 2. And we're going to continue to talk about communicable disease, but we're going to focus on East Africa. 
neglected tropical diseases, World Health Organization talks about visceral leishmaniasis, and it's a nickname Alakazar, and again, it's a severe form of leishmaniasis where you have ulceration due to these parasites that penetrate. Disease is fatal if, not, if untreated, and vaccines are still under development. In other words, not a lot of investment is being made in the treatment or vaccine preventive strategies. The infection is spread by the bite of sand flies. So the sand fly can be just so tiny. Uh, it, it, and I know that there were areas where we actually get, got uh, people who would volunteer to come and in the evening when the sand flies tend to bite to attract them and of course we would use the immediately remove them before they got bitten but they were used for human bait to do studies on the actual sand flies. This was with the Medical Research Council uh, out of the United Kingdom. Again, another neglected tropical disease is uh, schistosomiasis. And this is something that they nicknamed snail fever because the snail is the host. Instead of a copiapod, we've got the snail that carries the larvae to maturity and then reinfects the water, which then you know, contacts with people. So schistosomiasis is also in the Caribbean and Latin America. For example, in uh, St. Lucia, you have to be careful of the natural waters, bodies of water, because it, it, you can get schistosomiasis from them. It, it also was, used to be called bilharzia, is another name that you might be familiar with. So back into Africa, we're primarily looking now at Lake Victoria. So from this map, you could see Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda share a border here at Lake Victoria. This is Lake Tanganyika right here. It's a beautiful clear lake which is the deepest lake in, in, in Africa. It's very very narrow uh, but very very deep and clean. But Lake Victoria is very contaminated. So one of the sites that we went to often was to support a regional hospital in Bukoba and it's still in Tanzania, but it's right on Lake Victoria. It's a beautiful village, small, but do not swim in this, this, this water. You can see the fishermen, they would be exposed continuously as they're catching the tilapia and other types of freshwater fish that are in the lake, they'll be exposed to schistosomiasis. I might have mentioned that the, the problem is primarily right along the edge of the lake. So in the places where it's shallow enough that the s snails survive. I understand that from other colleagues who were working in Uganda that they would take a boat out and in the middle there are some islands that you can enjoy, go picnicking, go swimming, because in the center here there aren't any of the snails that transmit the schistosomes. But Lake Victoria and Lake Tanganyika are magnificent. And if you have not had a chance to travel in parts of Africa, um, west coast of Africa is very, very beautiful, tropical. It has a lot of the reserved, uh, unspoiled rainforest. You can go and uh, watch the herds of elephant go through, or chimpanzees, they have gorilla. And then East, East Africa, they have some magnificent game parks um, here in uh, Tanzania. The, this is a picture from there, and I know there are places where you, you drive up in your SUV on the dirt road, and you just look, and all you can see is pink as far as the eye can see. And it's the flamingos who migrate through Africa. They have their nesting areas in Tanzania and Kenya. And they, they flock here, and it's, it's magnificent, it's, it's uh, stunning. It would be well worth your effort to uh, travel there. Let's go back to our neglected tropical diseases. Now, here we've got one that's from Latin America, Chagas disease. That's the South American version of trypanosomiasis. No vaccine exists, and again, it's transmitted by the bite of an insect, but in this case, it's the assassin beetle. Treatment for early infection exists, but it's not. It's very expensive, and it again, it's very toxic. There's severe side effects for the treatment. 
So it's better. Prevention is better always. Chagas disease does not kill victims rapidly, and that's one of the big differences. When you have American trypanosomiasis, it is fatal, but it's much, much longer duration. That means that more and more of the disease can spread if it's left untreated. The bug will bite you and then pass the larvae on to another person. Let's go back to Africa. One of the things that I hadn't mentioned before was that when you're designing health interventions to try to improve the conditions in the public health, you have to consider the diversity. Africa is enormously diverse. The, as I mentioned, the north part of Africa is more Arab. You, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, and Niger Algeria, these are all very Arab countries. The same kind of influence you see in Ethiopia and in Sudan. It's actually uh, very desert-like, and so the, the, the environment there is different than Sub-Saharan Africa, which tends to get a lot of rainfall. It can be quite tropical in some areas. But the religions themselves, so they have Islam, Christian, and then traditional beliefs where they've got shaman, so you have to consider how you might be able to effectively change if, if it's a Muslim culture like it is in the central part here and along the east coast here because again the influence of the Muslims here in the Middle East is that they traveled all down here. This used to be part of the Persian Empire so you'll see a strong influence of the Islam throughout these areas that are kind of green. Whereas there are pockets that have Christian populations so these are all things that you'd have to consider to effectively create interventions because different traditional beliefs might be more uh, believing that it's some other kind of intervention. They'll have different types of treatments. Whereas in Islam, the Muslims believe that it's fate. And so they are more likely to not seek treatment because it's God's will that they die. Let's look at Sudan again, and you could see that this, uh, this picture tells it all, is that they have huge areas of drought, and it has been much more severe than anyone anticipated. And what has happened is the United Nations and other people that would have gone in with humanitarian aid, they actually had not figured it was going to be this bad, and they waited too long. So in Sudan, we had a lot more deaths than anticipated. And again, when people are living in refugee areas because of the civil war within Sudan, and they're fighting about oil, of course, they are, the people that are displaced, they have little access to even uh, the basics that they need. The shelters are just lean-tos. They have to walk long distances to get any sorts of water and food is very scarce, so the conditions there are very poor, so they're more likely to be exposed to vector-borne diseases. Here's a little girl, and the good news for Darfur is, is things aren't great, but they're getting better. And she's going to be going home. And that's one of the things about the areas within Sudan, is that United Nations officials are saying that many thousands of people are going home and that's uh, only a small fraction of people that are willing to return to their homes in Darfur but returning home is a very good indicator that things have settled down and that they will be returning to some kind of normal. So public health challenges, they're enormous. Is it mission impossible or is it impossible just because we haven't thought about the solution? Mission possible, let's be positive about this because after all, we're here and we want to help change the world. We're talking about neglected tropical diseases and now we're gonna have a video that's kind of, woo, it's very short little video, but it's very graphic and I think that it is the drama of monsters inside of me is really an effective teaching tool. So let me play this video for you. Dwight's 
suddenly starts to feel unwell. I just started to feel very, very weak. One day you wake up and you're just you're so weak that you can't hardly get out of bed. I just got weaker and weaker and weaker until I was so weak I couldn't stand on my own. What's astounding is that the illness that has Dwight fighting for his life started with a simple fly bite. Africa is a big place, and there's different animals, different pests in different places. But in Tanzania, you have the tsetse flies. They are about the size of a house fly and normally a little bit bigger, but they're just extremely aggressive, and you just hate to have them pestering you all day long. But the tsetse fly that bit Dwight wasn't just a nuisance. It was infected with a deadly parasite. A single-celled killer called Trapanosoma. And when the fly bit him, these parasites flooded into Dwight's bloodstream. Inside his body, these cunning intruders began to divide and elongate. They used their long tails, called flagellum, to swim throughout his bloodstream. The result is a severe case of trypanosomiasis, or African sleeping sickness. Dwight's immune system is helpless to stop the microscopic assassins. Each individual trypanosoma parasite is armed with a shield of proteins. In the bloodstream, white blood cells recognize these proteins as foreign, and they build up antibodies that attack the proteins. But trypanosomes can actually change their protein coat of armor, rendering the blood's antibodies useless. This leaves them free to reproduce and devastate the body's red blood cells. The very cells that carry nutrients and oxygen throughout the body. Starved of nutrients, the patient goes into a coma and ultimately dies. So let's go ahead and start on part three. The monsters inside of you. I don't know if you noticed in the video, it had the wildebeest, did you see them? And the elephants and the cheetahs. So these are animals that the tsetse fly is attracted to. So areas that have herding animals generally uh, are going to have a lot more tsetse flies. So we can choose to be healthy and we can choose to make a, a difference. So I think that what I'm trying to say is we need to try to face some of these global health challenges and think of new ways that we would be able to challenge them. One of the inspirational leaders, of course, of all time, who received the Nobel Prize was that Mother Teresa. I think that they, she was talking about poverty, and poverty is so closely linked to exposure to communicable disease. Because of civil war or whatever reason, people are more vulnerable outside, or they have inadequate housing, inadequate clothing. Believe me, when I travel, around the world. I have long sleeves, I have heavy jeans, I have socks pulled up and deep to protect me from these you know, mosquito-borne diseases, <coughs> all types of vector-borne diseases. You just have to cover up hat. There are even areas that you need to wear a netting over your face. Um, there are areas that have such intense insect activities you couldn't keep the sand flies or the gnats from biting you so you have they have strings with beads or a netting that protect you when you're out and about so you won't get bitten. So she's talking about poverty is not only being hungry and naked and homeless, but poverty is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. That's the greatest poverty. And we could start by to relieve some of that by having be kind within your own home country or own communities and in a way you can be a, a quiet example or a leader to others as Mother Teresa was. One of the global health champions that I want to introduce to you is Harshad Sangli, so we're going to talk about that in the next part. This is Global Health Unit 14 and this is the third part of this lecture. We're going to be talking about global health champions. This is one of the people that I feature on your list of global health champions. His name is Harshad Sangvi. His family originally is from India, but he grew up in Kenya. So again, a lot of people immigrate from India to the 
east coast of Africa. He's a really very remarkable man and he use, uh, works for Johns Hopkins University and he's devoted his life to the protection of women, focusing on women's health. And I had the privilege of working for him for several years uh, in Indonesia. He's a medical director and vice president of innovations for an NGO that's called JPIGO. And that's an acronym that's related to Johns Hopkins training sites. In addition, he's an obstetrician, so an OBGYN, and he w used to work years ago, he said he used to fly in Kenya to different locations with Doctors Without Borders to do different types of surgeries and assist women with deliveries. Here he is getting an uh, award. Harshad is in the middle here, We're flanked by all the different representing the different organizations that he's contributed to over the years. He's a global health champion, for sure. I really enjoyed and uh, working with Harshad Sangvi, and uh, I learned a lot from him. I think he really appreciated the work that I did for his uh, project, too, because we reduced the number of maternal deaths by 50 percent by we were doing an experimental intervention and we were successful and it was largely because I had really great team in Indonesia I had 250 individual staff members working with us and a lot of really excellent leadership but it's a whole cascade I was there to be the site manager uh, and getting direction and and support from Harshad in Baltimore because that's where Johns Hopkins University is. I really would encourage you to try to contact some of these global health champions, especially ones that are right there in Colombia. You've got Diana Restrepo Mejia and Francisco Lemus there at Uni Sabana. And I have given you those contacts, so it really would be great if you have a chance to interview someone that's actually worked in the health field internationally. Harshad received a medical education in Kenya, as I mentioned. He then did his residency and postdoctoral training in UK. He was in London and in the United States in New York City at uh, Columbia University. Harshad Sangvi has made invaluable contributions to the field of obstetrics, gynecology, and clinical epidemiology. He leads the technical and clinical approaches, designing and implementing low-cost solutions because a lot of the things are in Central Asia, so India, and different parts of Africa. Here's an innovative team that they were finding a rapid diagnostic test for cancer. And so this, again, is supporting women's health. So he's inspired a whole generation, a cadre of health workers that <clears throat> develop innovative ways to solve difficult problems. Another global health champion or mother, safe motherhood advocate is Sue Ellen Miller. She works for the University of California in San Francisco and she's the director of Global Safe Motherhood. And she, I met her in Asia when I was working with Harshad Sangvi in Indonesia. A remarkably energetic person and again, she's supporting the protection of women. And one of the videos that I would encourage you to watch for extra credit, it's optional, is about the work of Sue Ellen Miller. She's giving a TED Talk about safe motherhood. I won't play that video here, but I'm hoping you go ahead and, and watch it. Here she is in the field with her team. So the final portion of the lecture is related to our exercise and is about priority preventive strategies. One additional global health uh, champion is Catherine Schenkel Glacier. She is a remarkable woman, um, very, very strong, and I, I really admire all the work that she's done all over the world. She's a project director for results, which puts in health information systems. And whenever I had questions about 
anything that has to do with electronic records or different types of electronic mapping of progress reports and so on. She was our expert. She, I work with her at Johns Hopkins University and she institutionalized BASICS, which is a child uh, survival uh, intervention that's been very successful. She currently lives with her husband in Lebanon and so she's continuing to work in the region. But one of the things that she did that I found very inspiring is she spent time traveling in one of these mobile medical ships. And so you can see that it's basically a mobile hospital in a large ship. And this is the U.S. Naval Hospital Ship Comfort. And so it's remarkable the different ways that different people can contribute over time to different areas. So here's our exercise. Rx. Rx is a prescription. So prescription for survival. Are you going to survive? Now that's the question. Vector transmitted infectious disease prevention. So we're going to be considering how we're going to do it, how we're going to debate the best techniques for an intervention. So let's look at our vectors. Prescription for health. Ah, this is just the ordinary things, right? I mean, you everybody knows about Black Widow. Here's a great white. Here's a Portuguese man of war type of jellyfish. Scorpion, a green a viper. We've got our rabies bat. So these are ordinary things. We all know about these. These aren't anything new. These are hazards. They're not the neglected tropical diseases, are they? Look at the different ones that we've been talking about. What about human African trypanosomiasis? That was African sleeping sickness. We read about that. How about leprosy? That's another one. It's very much closely related to the, the same genus as tuberculosis, leprosy. We talked about Chagas disease, so that's American trypanosomiasis. But we hadn't talked about some of these others. Look, here's dengue. Everybody knows about dengue. Transmission of soil hemis, so you get worms, in other words. So I think that some parts of Africa where my family lived, my kids would just get dewormed twice a year by just kind of like what you do with the veterinarian with your pet because it's so common you just have to treat your kids. Trachoma, yaws, strongyloiditis, so there's a strongyloides, econococcus, so there are lots of different things. We mentioned leishmaniasis, so these are all neglected tropical diseases. Everybody knows about malaria, that's boring, meaning that there are lots of teams out there. It's not one of the neglected tropical diseases. It's transmitted by the bite of a female Anopheles mosquito. Eh, so we know about malaria. Viral illnesses, eh, we know about rabies. You can get a vaccine for rabies. Uh, working in the laboratory, I always had to be immunized against rabies. So the, there were times when we were exposed We'd get specimens in from who knows where in the Caribbean, and it was a infected cow's head or something. So we had to be immunized with mouse brain vaccine for rabies. So we know about rabies. Well, what about tro other tropical illnesses? So we've got our dengue, which is transmitted by the day-biting Aedes mosquito. You probably know quite a bit about dengue in Colombia. Viral encephalitis. That's the Culex mosquito. Again, it's a, a day-biting mosquito, so we have to keep our mosquito repellent on our long sleeves. But did you know about Beruli ulcers? So again, this, this organism that causes this type of infection, and that looks really gross, uh, the ulcer here on this child's face is related to mycobacterium, which is the same species as tuberculosis. We, everybody knows about leprosy. You heard about fig, people's fingers dropping off. It's in the Bible, the le leprosy causing disabling conditions, limbs and toes falling off. But what about trachoma? So here I've got our flies transmitting disease again. Or yaws, which is a type of illness vector-borne, again, that is very much like syphilis. It's a spirochete. It's a type of bacteria. So trachoma causes blindness. Here we have our assassin bug. We were talking about Chagas disease, and that's the American trypanosomiasis. 
Here we are. This is a serious condition with this child's face. But what about leishmaniasis? That's again Alcazar. It's uh, leishmaniasis that is in Latin America as well, and it's transmitted by a sandfly. And these, you can see how almost translucent this trans the sandfly is, and it really looks sand colored. And they're tiny. They're tiny little sandflies. So that would be something serious. Of course, we talked about African sleeping sickness, the trypanosoma uh, species that are transmitted by the tsetse fly. You can see that it's just a little bit bigger than a house fly, but let me tell you, boy, it just hammers you. It just keeps after you. It's just amazing, the aggressive fly. What about tapeworms? This is really kind of, mm, but you can get this tapeworm from your friendly, um, you know, undercooked meat. In this particular case, it's tenia, so it, we're, we're talking about the ones from pork. But what about Echinococcus? Have you heard about this one? This is a tapeworm that's a little teeny guy. It's not one of these huge, big, long ones, but Echinococcus is, we can get it from our uh, pets or our favorite little goat or lamb. So there are times when you need to be checking your pets and making sure that you can keep your health by not having these conditions transmitted to your family. Echinococcus, of course, is a tapeworm, and so you can get it from your pet, and it's a cycle between the pet and the domestic animal, like a goat or a sheep, but it also can in invade the man's uh, human body, too. Echinococcus is not a fun thing. It tends to go to your brain and your head, so this is what this is what this infection is. It's really gross. Everybody knows about elephantiasis. I mean, you've heard about that. You have the swelling of the legs here because the the microfilaria actually block the lymph nodes. So it's an incredibly complex disease, and it it's something that if it isn't treated, it gets worse and worse because the adult worms continue to produce the filariae or the larvae that then continue to block the lymph nodes. And unfortunately, it's not just the legs that get swollen. And uh, it could happen to a man's scrotum. It could happen uh, other parts of the body. So elephantiasis is, or lymphatic filariasis is really a, sa uh, a sad and very dangerous condition. It's transmitted by the black fly, which you see here. See how small it is? Tiny little guy. Or sand flies. But again, those are small as well, so you can be bitten and not really even know it. River blindness is another type of disease that's caused by microfilaria and the black fly. So river blindness is something that's a neglected tropical disease because it doesn't happen often. Guinea worms, we talked about those, and here's our little copiapod. Schistosomiasis, it's also called bilharzia. Again, this is the snail that transmits it and it can cause Lots and lots of adults gather into your GI tract, but also they escape into your peritoneal cavity. So it causes this great outgrowth. We've got liver flukes or blood flukes. And again, it's related to domestic animals. So in, this is more common in Asia, where they've got oxen as domestic animals. So our classroom exercise is for you to figure out a preventive strategy for vector-borne disease. Discuss and design preventive measures, and we'll have student group solutions. So insect-borne disease, let's go get it. After all, in this world, some people will always throw stones in your path, and it depends on what you make from them, a wall or a bridge. So let's, make that, let's meet that global health challenge. And uh, I'll be looking forward to your discussion forum for this communicable disease section, vector-borne disease prevention. Thank you.